For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus. Good afternoon. Today I want to talk a little bit about direct relief for those Californians that need it the most, the most vulnerable Californians. But first, just very briefly, uh, I want to just extend again our deep condolences to those uh, family members, loved ones uh, of those lives lost over the last 24 hours. Uh, I began yesterday's press conference by uh, making a point that yesterday we had the highest total number of deaths uh, since this disease began here in the state of California, 71 deaths yesterday. Today we recorded 63 deaths, some 821 families. Again, every number, not a statistic, but a life uh, being torn asunder. And I just want to extend uh, my heartfelt uh, condolences and also extend appreciation uh, for uh, not only those loved ones and the families impacted, uh, but I had the privilege yesterday of talking to over 150 faith leaders uh, from every conceivable part uh, of uh, this state. And one common thread was how one deals with grief at this time, particularly the loss uh, of a life and how one organizes funeral services and all the logistical challenges that in the best of the times are difficult, but at this moment are made even more challenging. And so again, I just felt incumbent important uh, to begin uh, by recognizing the totality of the crisis that's still at hand, uh, not only here in the state of California, but all throughout the nation. Our numbers yesterday were the highest recorded, but so were the nation's. Uh, and so by no stretch of the imagination are we out of the woods, uh, despite the fact that we put forward a framework yesterday to begin to consider uh, the prospects of reopening uh, certain sectors of our economy. I want folks to know we need to maintain our vigilance and we mean, need to maintain the path uh, that we are on, a path that is producing results. But again, we are not yet in a place where we need to be uh, so that we could start reopening. Uh, that said, uh, people are not uh, where they were just a few weeks ago. As it relates to unemployment claims, just in the last four weeks, 2.7 million Californians have formally filed for unemployment insurance. Uh, we are in the process right now of dealing with an unprecedented number of people making phone calls uh, into our EDD department, our Employment Development uh, Department. We are trying to process these applications and we're trying to turn around those applications uh, in real time. We're doing so not only for employees, uh, but independent contractors, for small business men and women, people that are self-employed. And I want to tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. But I want to first just begin by saying this. I just signed an executive order that will extend our call center so that we can meet the volumes of inquiry. We'll extend it from the hours of eight in the morning till eight in the evening, seven days a week. A few days back, I commented that the EDD department had a call center since 2013 that was operating from 8 a.m. to noon, just five days a week. That was when we had record low unemployment. Uh, and just like that, now 2.7 million people claiming uh, now the need for unemployment insurance in just over uh, one month. So now record number of call volumes. I want to just thank uh, our partners, uh, particularly at SEIU 1000 and the incredible workforce uh, that has been redeployed uh, to meet that demand. 740 individuals within EDD have repositioned themselves, gotten trained, uh, and are now redeployed uh, in a position uh, to address the call volume, but moreover, to be able to answer those calls uh, and give you quality information. 600 additional state employees are being redeployed between now and Monday to do the same. So in total, 1,300 and 40 individuals now will be redirected uh, and will start uh, the process of helping you process uh, your earned benefits. And so I just want to applaud uh, Julie Sue, uh, who will speak in a moment, uh, her department, Department uh, of Labor, uh, and the incredible partnership that she has formed uh, within her agency, uh, and all the men and women uh, that uh, went 
and did above and beyond work just on Easter as a proof point and specific example. We thought it was appropriate considering uh, the burnout and the volume uh, that we gave people a little time off on Easter Sunday. 500 of those state employees refused that time off because they cared more about you than they did themselves. And so while we, many of us, may have spent time with our families, they did not. And in turn, they were able to process a couple hundred thousand distributions just on Easter Sunday to help people most in need in the state of California. So if you ever have any doubt about the value of public employees, I hope you'll consider just that example. Uh, rather than stepping aside, they stepped in and they took the time to consider other people first, not just themselves. When they deserved that time off, they didn't take that time off. And so I just want to applaud all of those uh, that did uh, heroic work on Easter Sunday and continue to do heroic work every single day to process what looks like a million or so payments now a week. Those numbers uh, we hope will get even greater, even higher rather, uh, in the next few weeks. But that's the current processing, a couple hundred thousand uh, checks on a day that we're able to turn around uh, through these efforts and other efforts that have been put into place uh, at EDD. So that's an update specifically on unemployment insurance. And by the way, uh, those checks are retroactive uh, in many cases, particularly as it relates to the $600 uh, dollar per week uh, additional check that are being received from the federal government's stimulus support. Uh, and so people uh, should look forward to getting those checks. By the way, they're not really checks, they're debit cards uh, in the mail. Uh, and see those debit cards transferred in their possession uh, in very short order. As I said, there's one and a half million that are self-employed. Uh, one and a half million uh, small business men and women, uh, individuals uh, that have no other employees uh, that are also uh, deserving of direct assistance. Uh, the federal government created a program called PUA, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. Uh, that PUA program uh, we are now setting up in the state of California. And we're doing so in a very methodical and thoughtful way. Uh, instead of just putting out applications and having people wait weeks and weeks and weeks uh, for eligibility uh, and for notification around the distribution of payments. Uh, we are organizing a very deliberative process in real time to set up our PUA system in a way where we can turn around checks within 24 to 48 hours. I'll ask Julie Sue to come up, up in a moment and talk a little bit more specifically about that. But I want to make this point about the PUA process. Uh, this is not a way to avoid misclassification. The state of California prides itself on being a national leader as it relates to protecting our workers from misclassification. And it is not a way of protecting uh, those in platform economy, the gig economy, uh, from not providing wage data to the state of California. They must provide that wage data for the state of California. If we were in receipt of that data, uh, we would use the traditional lines of unemployment uh, insurance, but not all of those employers are paying into the unemployment insurance uh, uh, process. And that's indeed why the state of California uh, advanced uh, what is well known within the state, uh, a decision where we codified through AB5, uh, a bill that I signed, the Dynamax decision uh, on relationship with relationship to this issue where the state Supreme Court unanimously adjudicated uh, in favor of addressing these misclassifications. So I just want folks to know um, that their status, even if they choose the PUA process, is not at peril in terms of their benefits and the ultimate determination of their classification. I just want to make that crystal clear, nor uh, does it uh, push us backwards in terms of advancing the cause of righting those wrongs uh, and continuing to transition uh, and implementation uh, of AB5 itself. Again, uh, I'll ask Julie Sue in just one second to talk more about that as well. One final thing, I am a fan of employment insurance. This is something when I was a former mayor of San Francisco during the Great Recession, uh, we uh, were able to work with Speaker Nancy Pelosi to get a pilot uh, through the federal appropriations to put together an employment insurance, not just an unemployment insurance program. It's commonly referred to uh, across the country as a work share program. 
the state of California has a modest work share program. Uh, we want to advance that program. We want to expand it significantly, get more employers into that program. I signed an executive order on that as well today to significantly increase the time uh, to applica uh, application, the time uh, to the creation and development of those programs. Uh, and I don't want to moralize this. I don't want to get into a national frame right now, but I can just say this. I think one of the most significant things we can do in the United States of America is reimagine our unemployment system and do more of what you're seeing in countries like Germany and elsewhere are doing, and that's provide the employment insurance so people can stay uh, in their status, their benefits included, uh, even with reduced hours uh, in an economy, even uh, as acute and challenging as ours today. The federal government did a version of this in the CARES Act as relates to that Paycheck Protection Program. It's a variant, but I think the opportunity to do this at scale uh, avails itself, certainly at a national frame, but also to begin anew to think about how we can scale that program, our work share program, in the state of California. So that was the purpose of the executive order. Extend those hours, 8 to 8, starting Monday. Extend our ability to process even more checks. Uh, encourage people to fill out uh, the unemployment insurance forms. Let self-employed uh, individual contractors know of the availability now of our PUA program and let folks know that that status as it relates to that determination of your classification as an employer or an independent contractor will not be impacted by the creation of that program. With that, let me ask Julie Sue to come in and fill in some of the blanks. Thank you so much, Governor. I just wanted to acknowledge that there is frustration in California over unemployment insurance benefits, and the governor's executive order today is going to um, allow us to open up um, the hours of our call center so that those of you who are seeking a live person to talk to, to get help, will be able to do that much more easily. We will be seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. beginning Monday. Also, on the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, or PUA, we will be launching that application on April 28th. So in roughly two weeks, the application will be up. It will apply to those who are self-employed, those who are independent contractors, also to employees whose wage data is not sufficient, their work history is not sufficient to qualify for unemployment insurance. And, and to others who have exhausted their unemployment insurance benefits. So uh, once you apply on April 28th, you will be able to certify the next day, and we are going to be turning around payments uh, within 24 to 48 hours. So those first payments should be out by April 30th. I know many of you have been waiting for that. Um, I want to reiterate the governor's point that once payments begin, they are retroactive. Uh, the program begins in terms of when you can receive money if you were unemployed due to COVID-19 as of the first week of February. So the checks, the payments that you receive, the benefits will, in, will go all the way back to that first week of February if you um, can uh, attest that you were affected by COVID-19 as of that time. In addition, the $600 per week uh, on top of the regular unemployment insurance benefits will also apply to PUA starting uh, on March 29th. So again, when our applications go up in a couple of weeks, that money will also um, be, be retroactive. Uh, I'll just add one last thing. There's been a lot of um, conversation about the uh, technology limits um, here in California. Uh, our technology limits uh, do not make um, our uh, inevitable that we will not be able to provide services. And so we're continuing to pay unemployment insurance benefits um, within the three-week time frame that was true uh, before this pandemic. Thank you. We're very proud of our Labor Secretary, and she'll, of course, avail herself to any question. But that last point she made, I think, is a really important point. We had a 21-day processing uh, of unemployment insurance claims uh, before this pandemic, and we're still uh, within that window uh, in terms of her capacity and her team's capacity uh, to turn around those payments. And I just want to applaud her uh, for her capacity to surge uh, those efforts. We started, she started intentionally, 
And by not focusing on the call center as much as processing the claims, because we really wanted to prioritize getting checks out as quickly as possible. And now we are at a position where we can do that and expand the call center uh, and address the volume and needs as well. So all of this an iterative process, all of this building um, on uh, the efforts uh, that are well, built from the previous day and correcting and addressing and adjusting uh, our efforts in real time. Speaking of uh, addressing uh, real time need, uh, our diverse communities in the state of California include our immigrant uh, communities. I don't know if many people know this, uh, but it's a remarkable thing. One half of our children in the state of California are born uh, to at least one member of their family uh, that is an immigrant. One half. This is a state where 27 percent of us are foreign born. Uh, that's diversity at a scale that doesn't exist in any other state uh, in our nation. And regardless of your status, documented or undocumented, uh, there are people in need. And this is a state that steps up always to support those in need, regardless of status. 10 percent, 10 percent of California's workforce is undocumented. 10 percent. Any overrepresentation of that workforce is undocumented in the areas that are so essential to meeting the needs of tens of millions of Californians today, in the healthcare sector, in the agriculture and food sector, in the manufacturing and logistics sector, and in the construction sector. There's an Oprah representation of people uh, without documentation. By the way, paying just last year over two and a half billion dollars of local and state taxes. Those are individuals that do not benefit from the PUA program, don't benefit from the UI, the unemployment insurance benefit program, don't benefit from the stimulus that was just signed by the president, the $2.2 trillion. Yet many in mixed status families are having a hard time taking care of their children and taking care of you and your loved ones in skilled nursing uh, facilities, uh, on the job site, making sure your food is being procured and distributed and making sure you have the ability to go to a grocery store and have something stocked there on the shelves. Uh, we feel a deep sense of gratitude uh, for people that are in fear of deportation but are still addressing the essential needs of tens of millions of Californians. And that's why uh, I'm proud as governor to be the first state to announce a program uh, for direct disaster assistance to those individuals. Uh, we're putting up $75 million in partnership with philanthropy. Philanthropy is matching our efforts, not dollar for dollar, but they're putting in an additional $50 million to support our efforts, so a total of $125 million to provide individual assistance of $500 and household assistance up to $1,000 for those individuals uh, that are quite literally uh, putting themselves on the line uh, and helping support uh, this economy and those most at need at this moment. I want to in particular thank the Emerson Collective, uh, Chan Zuckerberg, James Irvine uh, Foundation, the California Endowment, and Blue Shield Foundation. Uh, they seeded the philanthropic part of this. Uh, Lorraine Powell Jobs, $1 million uh, through Emerson, uh, they put into this effort. There's a group called GCIR. Uh, that's a philanthropy group. They're the ones organizing uh, that $50 million raise and that $50 million goal. Uh, and for me, that's enlivening. It's also ennobling because it's just a recognition, even from some of our world's great philanthropists that happen to reside here in the state of California, that they recognize uh, that all of us are in this together and that we have a responsibility uh, to one another. And even if there's gaps, that we can help begin to fill them. I'm not here to suggest that $125 million is enough, uh, but I am here to suggest it's a good start, and I'm very proud it's starting here in the state of California. And by the way, all our efforts are not limited just to direct uh, financial relief. Uh, I uh, made clear last week uh, that we are allowing what we call presumptive eligibility 
to exist through our Medi-Cal system in the state of California uh, so people can get tested, not just in the emergency room, uh, not just at hospitals, but get tested in community clinics and get those clinics reimbursed, not only for the tests, but treatment related uh, to this disease and COVID-19. Uh, remember, in the United States of America, we have universal health care. It's in the emergency rooms. And you, as a taxpayer, pay exponentially more on the back end uh, than providing the kind of preventative care on the front end that costs you less as a taxpayer and helps keep more of us healthier and safer. And so this is an example uh, with this uh, communicable disease uh, that can spread easily to make sure people know that they can have access to testing and know that they don't have to go out of pocket uh, to get tested and get treatment uh, if indeed uh, they are tested positive. This is a good health strategy uh, and it's a right moral and ethical and I would argue economic thing to do. And so that's an additional area of support uh, that's part and parcel of our broader efforts to help our diverse communities in the state of California, child care, food banks, and others uh, made available as needed to help the most vulnerable, keep people at work, those that need to be at work for essential services. Uh, all again, part of the package and the pride uh, that we have uh, in California and Californians at this moment uh, to do more and to do better. Again, I recognize we still have more to do in this space, and obviously uh, I want to extend recognition of that and also pre extend appreciation uh, that uh, we will endeavor to find more areas of support over the next days and weeks, and certainly uh, over the next year as we transition uh, back uh, to some version of normalcy, a lot of which we spoke uh, to yesterday. Uh, let me now briefly speak to a few uh, additional things that we do on a daily basis, and that's to give you an overall view of the trend lines uh, and give you some proof points and data uh, that have come in in the last 24 hours. Uh, speaking of 24, 24,424 individuals have tested positive for COVID-19 to date. I gave you the number of people that have lost their lives, 821. The number of people in our hospitals, in our ICUs, uh, we had some favorable numbers that came out yesterday. Hospitalization rate went up 1.5%. Again, we wanna see that declining. We wanna now start to see that to flat, flatten, and we want ultimately uh, to see those numbers go down. Decline from their growth, flatten, and then go down. Speaking of going down, there were 1,175 uh, individuals in the ICUs. That number actually went down from yesterday, 0.2%. That's a very good sign, the number of what we refer to PUIs. I know we're PUAs, PUIs, UI, a lot of acronyms. Uh, that's government. Uh, let me make it a little simpler. Remember, PUIs are the number of persons under investigation in the hospitals and in our ICUs, those numbers are also trending down uh, by multiples of that 0.2%. So that's good news as well. I'll remind you what I do on a daily basis. Those are the two numbers I look at every morning when I wake up first. And those are the numbers uh, that will guide our decisions when we ultimately expand our testing capacity in the state of California, expand our ability to trace uh, and ultimately isolate and quarantine individuals, part of the six specific strategies, the framework uh, that we laid out that will allow us to pull back uh, and ease up as it relates to the stay at home order. But we are not there yet. And it is absolutely incumbent upon all of us to continue the appropriate practices that have put us in this position uh, that have helped support uh, those uh, lines beginning to flatten and now beginning to decline. Let's stay at it stay the course uh, and continue uh, to do everything we can uh, to meet this moment head on. So that's broad strokes, what I wanted to share with all of you today. Uh, of course, we're here to answer any questions and provide additional insight and data to the extent we have it uh, with uh, those uh, that uh, may be on the line uh, that have queries. Andrew Sheeler, SACB. Uh, Governor, uh, can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Can you hear me okay, Governor? Yeah. Yes. Hello? Oh, we're here. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, uh, Governor, thank you for your time. Uh, 
So temporary hospitals are being set up. Uh, there's a 900-bed hosp- temporary hospital in a gymnasium at Cal Poly here in San Luis Obispo. Um, but there's no indication that they're going to be used anytime soon. Uh, do you think that we're over-planning and or overspending on these? Uh, do you think that these are going to be used? And if so, uh, can you explain why? Well, we, I don't know that the word over-planning uh, in a pandemic uh, applies. I think we are appropriately planning. Uh, we have been appropriately planning in this surge phase to meet the needs based upon modeling uh, that would require us to find an additional 50,000 alternative care sites uh, beyond our licensed hospital uh, bed uh, total system. Uh, we are doing more every day to secure not only the sites, but to secure the PPE and the personnel for those sites. For this reason, we're not out of the woods. I told you those death rates, are the highest recorded yesterday. The hospitalization rates are still too high. The rate of concern uh, continues uh, to permeate systems all across the state of California, large and small. And let me extend consideration as well. The announcement we made yesterday around our phased uh, strategy based upon science, based upon health data, also assumes that if people go back into the community and begin to have contact where they're not putting on face coverings, where they're not always practicing the kind of physical distancing that they currently are with the stay at home order, that we could see an increase in the number of people infected. We have to provide the capacity in the system and make sure we procure that capacity before we enter in to that next phase. So every one of those beds, from my perspective, are important in terms of our capacity to deliver on the hope and promise that we can start to ease up on the home, uh, uh, the home orders. And so uh, I don't think uh, it's an overcorrection. I think it's an appropriate adaptation uh, to the current uh, new normal uh, and provide us the kind of relief valves uh, if indeed we need them without having uh, to be in a crisis mode, uh, but having already planned in that respect. Bob Agelko, SF Chronicle. Oh, thank you. Uh, Governor, uh, different subject. Uh, I see that a, a state legislator has asked you to uh, uh, halt all sales of uh, firearms and ammunition statewide. wondered if you had any views on whether uh, gun sales were an essential or non-essential service or whether this should be a county by county decision. Yeah, we made the determination on directives going back weeks now uh, when asked specifically this question about LA County and their efforts saying I defer to the sheriffs uh, and their determination at the local level. Ibarra, Cal Matters. Hi, Governor. Um, you mentioned testing in community clinics, and we know testing is an issue. And I've talked to clinics where they have just 20 tests, if any. And so when you send, you know, if we're sending low-income, undocumented people to these clinics, um, what are you doing to make sure that, you know, these clinics are prepared to support these patients they are actually able to, you know, give patients tests? And, and, um, and services? No, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. It's the right question. It's one we anticipated uh, a week or so ago with the creation of a testing task force uh, led uh, by a uh, leader of uh, one of the largest insurance uh, companies in California, as well as uh, leaders in academia and research from Stanford University, RUCs, among others. Uh, we set out very specific and prescriptive goals in terms of increasing our testing. Uh, I was very adamant that we needed to improve this space and took responsibility as it relates to uh, doing more and expecting more of our entire team. Uh, last night, we got new numbers back that showed 12,200 additional tests were conducted in the last 24 hours. That's within the prescribed framework of our announcement a week ago. The goal was to get to 10,000 tests a day by April 14th. The goal at the end of this month is to get to 25,000 tests and then to grow exponentially from there into May 
and June. Uh, that is using the totality uh, of strategies, uh, not just traditional PCR testing, but the new serology uh, testing, the blood-based testing. Uh, and now with that as a primer, I think it only appropriate, because he's standing right in front of me, that I asked Dr. Galley, uh, who's led this effort, to talk a little bit more specifically about the granularity of community clinics in relationship to the testing protocols as well. Thank you for the question. Uh, absolutely to reiterate what the governor said, our goal has been all along to make sure that testing is available throughout California. We see our community clinics and frankly all points of care in the community as potential testing sites. Uh, in fact, I've been on emails and phone calls today with some of the clinics about ramping up this capacity so we make sure um, certain communities, communities that are traditionally underserved, do get the testing that they need. Um, over the weekend, we received a shipment of swabs here that we did distribute throughout the state um, and targeting some of those clinics, some of those healthcare delivery system centers that don't traditionally have the supplies first. Um, we plan to get some of those to community clinics so that specimen collection, which is the first step in getting a test done, can happen throughout the state. We will be working with clinics to make sure that that is available. And part of those additional up to 100,000 test swabs a week that we'll be receiving will get distributed to those clinics. I will tell you also, by way of additional update, that we have identified at least 637 sites, testing sites across the state. Many of these are affiliated with the big hospitals, but then additionally, these are the drive up um, test centers that are popping up throughout the state um, through the leadership of counties, cities, and other entities. We also know after doing a complete look at many of the different labs across the state, that we have the capability today with instruments that are already acquired and working to do up to 94,000 tests a day in the state of California. So as we identify our capacity, we start to move some of the um, important parts of the testing continuum, whether that's swabs, test kits, et cetera. And now the plan to really accelerate the number of testing sites across the state. We look forward to not just meeting that 25,000 day a test or tests a day goal, but exceeding it as new technologies, as the governor mentioned, with ser serologic tests, additional um, uh, instruments coming to augment that 94,000 a day. Um, we look forward to seeing that number increase in community clinics and communities that don't traditionally get tests first are a priority at this moment. Thank you, doctor. And speaking of tests, I neglected to mention there's no income-based tests uh, for individuals to receive the disaster relief regardless of their status. And I think that's important to know as well, is to know that their personal information uh, will not be uh, uh, required to get those supports. Uh, we're building that disaster relief program through community-based organizations geographically dispersed throughout the state of California. They will collect the grants directly uh, in every community, a minimum of $5 million in grants and then substantially more uh, in higher density communities. Uh, and the CBOs will be responsible for distributing uh, those dollars. Uh, and by the way, I want to extend both in the terms of the testing question and more broadly on the disaster relief fund itself, uh, let people know that the covid19.ca.gov website, covid19.ca.gov website, is now operational uh, in Spanish and will have the capacity to have seven languages where it will be translated uh, very, very shortly. And information and guides are available as it relates to testing in community clinics and the reimbursement under the Medi-Cal system to those clinics and the need uh, for our diverse communities to not worry about going out of pocket. If you are feeling symptoms, don't worry about not quote unquote getting tested, get the kind of help and health care you deserve in those community clinics. Uh, we'll worry about the paperwork. Uh, we'll worry about organizing uh, the reimbursements uh, through the Medi-Cal system. Rachel Bluth, Kaiser Health News. 
Hi, Governor. Um, I was just wondering uh, if you've been in contact a lot with leadership in the legislature about what they're prioritizing going forward uh, as far as legislation and the budget and what those conversations are looking like, how, how you're discussing that with them. Well, I had this morning a call with the speaker, Anthony Rendon, with our pro tem, Tony Atkins. We are in constant uh, contact and communication. Uh, my teams uh, are available uh, as needed to both caucuses uh, in the Assembly and the Senate, including a Republican caucus, not just the Democratic caucus. We try to be as responsible and responsive as we can be. I'll be uh, on a Zoom call today with the Latino caucus talking precisely uh, about uh, issues related to the budget, uh, expectations and needs related uh, to legislation, and the legislative calendar, which, as you know, has substantially changed as a consequence. So we're in constant contact and communication. Uh, we will be more formally engaging. They'll start their budget oversight hearings as early as tomorrow. Uh, we'll get the feedback and guidance on the basis of uh, those dynamic hearings. And then we look forward to opening it up to the public, because the public, of course, is most essential in a representative democracy in terms of their voice being heard through this process as well. Tanu Henry, California Black Media. Thank you, Governor. Um, I have a question about testing. Um, Dr. Rodney Hood, who is the past president of the National Medical Association, um, he serves uh, one of those underserved communities uh, you mentioned. Um, his, his patients are mostly African Americans at risk um, for many of the conditions we know that um, contribute to the high mortality rate for uh, African Americans. Um, it's been one of the census tracts, one of our most underserved um, census tracts in the state. Um, he reached out to a private lab that could only commit to get him 10 tests, yep. and they, they promised him they'll do the best they can to get him those tests. Um, who does Dr. Hood reach out to right now to make sure he's in the queue when those tests start to come available? Um, to medical centers around the state? Does he reach out to the county, to the state, um, to private labs? Um, what's the process or some of the protocols around that? I'll ask Dr. Galley to talk about the, the detailed protocols, but let me, in this specific instance, let you know, I referenced a moment ago uh, my conversation with faith leaders all across the state. This specific example, this specific doctor, this specific request actually came to our attention yesterday. So you have, and uh, individuals on that Zoom call also uh, brought this uh, directly to me uh, in an uh, uh, effort to be as responsive as I can. Uh, I also have my doctor, Dr. Galley, with me to talk a little bit more about it. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for the question. Dr. Hood should certainly work through uh, his local public health department to determine the best way to get access to testing and to make sure that the collection of the swabs and the specimens do get to the labs that can run the tests as quickly as possible for his patients. And all clinics should begin to think about what are their protocols, procedures to be able to do testing in their sites and be able to get those tests to places to process the specimens quickly so patients and families and communities can get results as quickly as we can provide them. Next question. Carla Marinucci, Politico. Uh, hi, Governor. You mentioned it, Amy. Uh, a lot of folks were surprised last week by the sudden resignation of your appointment on business and economic issues, Lenny Mendoca. Um, does that, especially during the, the, a business crisis and on Good Friday, et cetera, did this suggest some kind of rift in your administration? Oh. And a lot of business folks are wondering um, what's your plans with regard to maybe enlisting another business leader to take over. I, you mentioned a, a working group on that. And then quickly, Representative Jackie Spear just posted this on Twitter, <laughs> wondering if you want to take it. Um, okay. Can someone explain to me how Texas has been approved for a billion dollars more in SBA loans, more than 30,000 loans, more than California, despite our economy being a trillion dollars? Yeah. Let me, uh, on the first front, uh, Lenny Menanza is one of my old friends. He's an extraordinarily talented individual, uh, unequivocally, absolutely uh, no riff, quite the contrary. Uh, and, uh, and I just wish him the best, and I don't want to get into exactly why he needed to step aside for this moment, uh, but uh, we are not uh, supportive 
of Lenny. Uh, I am a rabid fan uh, of Lenny's and have known him and worked very closely with him uh, since my days as a county supervisor uh, and uh, continue uh, to uh, anticipate uh, a long relationship with him. I specifically, as you reference, and I appreciate the reference, have been making reference to an announcement on economic development later this week. Uh, we are still queued up to do just that, uh, to supplement our efforts. Uh, it's gonna take more than any one individual uh, to really begin the process of jumpstarting our economy. Uh, we have a task force that we established in this space going back literally, I think, six or so weeks ago. Uh, we're gonna socialize a little bit of that work uh, and also provide you uh, more details and scope uh, of the team we put together, broadened uh, and expanded, uh, and what we anticipate and hope uh, their work product uh, will look like over the course of the next weeks uh, and months. As it relates to uh, that tweet, I can't refer specifically uh, to the Texas example, but let me uh, make this clear to you uh, and also make this clear to people watching at home. I've made this uh, very direct appeal to the speaker. Uh, as it relates to the SBA loans, specifically the PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, California has been shortchanged in that respect. We're trying to understand exactly why. As you know, we were the first to get SBA approval on the waivers to draw down on the disaster relief funds. Uh, we've been very aggressive in this space. Uh, we have been aggressive in promoting and marketing uh, this program. But as I speak, just 8.4% uh, of those dollars from that program have flown into the state of California, about 5% of the loans. You do the math, one out of seven individuals in the United States reside in the state of California, 11, 12% of America's economy. Uh, we want to see those numbers improve. Here's a caveat, and it's an important caveat. Uh, there is still, well, roughly $100 billion. I don't want to be held to account exactly the total amount of money, uh, but up to that still hasn't been distributed. So those numbers may change in real time. But know this, I appreciate uh, Congresswoman Jackie Spears' vigilance on this. Know we are very vigilant on this as well, and have made it clear uh, to our congressional representatives, uh, led by Speaker Pelosi, uh, that any subsequent efforts in this space need to address uh, the needs of the Western United States uh, and those uh, that are anxious about this first come, first serve status, which respectfully, and I know a thing or two about small businesses, uh, creates a dynamic uh, where those phone lines open up for banks and establishments on the East Coast first, and with time three hours rolls around here later, those things are capped. That also has to be considered broadly in any reform. So we're leaning into this space. Final question, Kathleen Ronane, AP. Hi, Governor. Uh, so yesterday, you know, you announced the roadmap for reopening California. And I'm just wondering, in the 24 hours since you announced that, what kind of reaction have you gotten from across the state? Um, and have you heard from any um, counties or local governments that, that feel that they have it more under control and may want to try to um, open up on a, on a quicker timeline uh, than the state will be doing? And then secondly, um, you mentioned that you're going to make six task forces or teams to look at these six criteria that you outlined. Um, and will they have any, um, you know, public meetings or information that they're, you know, producing to the public on, on uh, their work? Yeah, let me be specific to that. I mentioned yesterday that we are going to update you on a weekly basis as it relates to the progress in each of those six categories. So rest assured uh, that is a commitment, firm, anchored on a weekly basis to update you on the progress in each of those six areas informed by these uh, task forces that have already been operationalized uh, for very many weeks here at the Emergency Operations Center and those new ones that are being formed with more nuance and specificity uh, related to the guidance we put out yesterday. Uh, this may seems self-serving, uh, but you asked a question directly. Let me directly respond. At least those that reached out to me personally, uh, I think uh, were very favorable, uh, cautiously so, uh, about 
hearing uh, of this roadmap. Uh, many helped inform the roadmap because, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we were in calls uh, and in constant communication uh, with a lot of local officials in terms of the developing them in the first place. So that shouldn't be surprising. Uh, but there were a few inquiries um, in some of the rural parts of the state uh, that I thought were very favorable, including this insight, and I'll just end with this, um, by a Republican legislative leader uh, that reached out uh, that expressed concern in this respect, said, I appreciate uh, the guidelines, broad strokes. I'm worried about the tracing side of this. He mentioned this, that the data that is being traced and tracked in parts of rural California is not adequate. And he said, please do not be misled by technology and inadequate data collection to make determinations of what's really happening on the ground. I thought that was a very helpful insight, and it's just a demonstrable example, the kind of feedback uh, that we are receiving in real time that we continue to look forward to receiving over the course of the next number of weeks, the next many months. Um, we are not ideological in this endeavor. We, as I said yesterday, are open to argument and we are driven by evidence. That's not rhetorical, that's real. Uh, and as I said, the most important thing we can do, said this yesterday, is to end as we began, where we went into this together in a very deliberative way. We need to pull out of this together in a very deliberative way as well. And speaking about everybody being in this together, uh, I just want to continue to compliment and thank uh, all of the incredible workforce uh, that has been assembled to help support not just the applications and the distribution of disaster relief funds and unemployment insurance, uh, but now setting up this new PUA system, the pandemic uh, unemployment assistance system. I want to thank uh, our frontline employees again, the heroes uh, every day on the front lines, our nurses and doctors, our police officers, our firefighters, uh, and then the unsung heroes, all of you that every day are practicing physical distancing, that have put us in this position where for two out of the last three days, I've been able to say the following, our ICU numbers are beginning to decline. Thank you for a job well done. Let's keep at this and let's continue uh, to improve the state, not only of California, uh, but the health of millions of Californians that rely on our practicing safe and appropriate physical distancing. Thank you, everybody. For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus.